All right, man. This is officially, officially our inaugural run with our with our uh, um with our recording for like video. Yeah, and it's the it. big reveal. This is what we look like. Oh yeah, <laughs> awful. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, the one thing I was I was also thinking about with this was like uh, because in the last I swear in the last episode didn't we say that that one was being recorded and it got botched or something like isn't that what we did well wait our last episode was with uh derek oh right 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 we we don't record those yeah the one before that was the one that we said we were gonna do and i can't remember what happened but yeah for sure yeah Yeah, we something happened there didn't yeah it didn't happen that's that's what (laughs) that's what i do know it didn't yeah it it just didn't go down so okay cool well um so yeah, so uh, uh, I don't even know what episode we're on either. No, I mean neither. We we uh, we're excited to have a guest. Hopefully, we can have him on again in the future. Uh, Mark Vigil with the uh, Miles of Hope. Oh right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we uh, well, part of it is is uh, we just got done doing a training for our clinicians, so we're probably our minds are burned out for a minute here right. on that stuff. But yeah. but no, we're happy to be doing it. So. Um, well, so one of the things we're we're planning on talking about today is uh, you're you're going through an academy right now, like yeah. a, like a police academy. Is it anything like the movies? It um, well, it's all digital right now, so it's absolutely nothing <laughs> like the movies. <laughs> yeah. Dude, those movies were so cool back in like I I still watch like them. Police they, Academy. Yeah, yeah, they hold up, and and some of those like they're just they're just funny, you know, like yeah. some of the things that, and then I love it the like the epic things at the end that they're doing, like uh, to like, you know, fight crime or whatever. The hell they're yeah. Say, dude. yeah. Like who's that dude, Steve Gutenberg or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. You don't remember the, police Academy? Movies? I remember his name. Okay. Yeah. The goop bro. The goop. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're all, Oh yeah. That guy. Oh yeah. 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 That's right. So, our, our trainers are pretty awesome. Uh, what, so tell yeah. me about it. What's going on with it, man. All right. So it's uh, a few weeks. Mm-hmm. So it's it's the full deal. Um, it's uh, like seven a.m. to five p.m. We, we go straight through, and uh, because of COVID, of course, we're doing it all online. But I don't know. They, I've got to say, they've actually really put together a pretty good training. Uh, a lot more goes into being a correctional officer than I'd thought. Mm-hmm. You know, I I know it's just more than making sure that dudes don't break out of prison. That is a huge piece of it. Security is number one, but yeah, there's tons of policy and procedure stuff. There's stuff on like firefighting techniques. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, when I when I uh, when I was up there, I, I had to fight an actual fire when I was up there. Yeah, really. That's no joke. Yeah, when I was going through that same academy, they had me. There's a, yeah, they. Well, it's fun. It's 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 kind of crazy. They had a like a fire that was. Um, it's out of a machine, so I, I imagine it's all propane or whatever. And then, uh, what what's the acronym for it though? Is it um, base? Let's see what I see. It put me on the spot. I don't remember. I think the acronym was like, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> obviously, yeah. hopefully yeah. nobody yeah. from yeah. Wyoming Department of Corrections. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I know you're supposed to point it yeah. at the base yeah. of it and then sweep and then sweep it. Yeah, and yeah. that's really it. Yeah, yeah. and and aim. Aim. You gotta aim. aim. Base sweep abs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there it is. It yeah, is yeah, for sure. Okay, base sweep. Yeah, and so I did yeah. that, but I was like talking crap beforehand. Yeah. So I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna nail this or whatever. I don't even remember what I was saying. So the guy who was doing it didn't put the fire out, and I was like, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah. So, even though I did yeah. it the right way. Yeah, and then burned the building fun. down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then that, that was the, that's uh, why it's digital now. That there was the like, major fire. Not, yeah, yeah. It was the, that was the old fire of 2020. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it's pretty cool though. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Cause it digitally, I mean, it probably just wouldn't have the same feel. Like, it's, I mean, no, it's not gonna have the same feel as what you went through, but that, that again, the trainers are pretty engaging. So that's uh, cool. Yeah. It makes it nice. Yeah. That's cool. At least. Uh, well, that's good. So, well, and that kind of made me want, want to talk about tonight. Like, uh, a lot of the work that we do yeah. is, um, uh, is involved with, um, correctional officers and, and essentially a lot of the work that we're doing is, is in their, you yeah. know, their territory. They're, they're, um, providing uh, a forum, uh, you know, through which we're, we're providing the services of treatment to these clients and, um, having to go in there and do the services 
you know, there's there's just a different mentality and um, in terms of like correctional officers versus therapists. Right. And one of the things is, I mean, we can obviously like identify some of the, I don't know, the, the silliness that's sometimes associated with it. But also, um, I, I think one thing I'd like to talk about is for therapists who are looking to go into that field, you know, maybe not necessarily like a survival guide, but um, I guess tricks of the trade that you and I have learned that have helped us kind of navigate that system and do better at being able to provide those services for the clients that we're working with, um, while at the same time respecting the officers and their positions, and um, you know, and and being able to work with them you know, for, for you know better outcomes and stuff like that. So, I think it seems like a kind of worthwhile topic, you know. But, yeah. Well, right, and a lot, a lot of we have common goals with, you know, with corrections, treatment and corrections have, you know, there, there's some uh, overall, we, you know, want what's best for the society and helping, helping people, uh, keeping people safe. Uh, but at, at times our, our goals can appear to diverge and that can create some, like, I guess, potentially tension if you don't know how to deal with it, mm-hmm. you know, like, like, like for <clears throat> instance, with, you know what? I mean, I guess this would be more, more applicable to uh, probation than the relationship we have with, with probation. But you know, we're always encouraging our dudes to uh, learn new hobbies, get out and uh, you know explore new leisurely pursuits. And a lot of times, these dudes' uh, probation restrictions or parole restrictions uh, prevent that at mm-hmm. a time. And so, like that, I you know I've noticed over the years that sometimes there's some tension that builds up and. You know, uh, sometimes therapists can like, ah, God, PO's always, you know, putting the foot down. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes COs are like therapists <clears throat> always just trying to, you know, let loose, you know, bleeding heart type people. And mm-hmm. uh, there's there's definitely a, a, like an art to being able to blend the two and maintain a relationship with your client that, you know, helps them actualize their goals while at the same time uh, keeping in the good graces of, you know, security uh, whether that's in an institution or on on probation, like you can you can navigate both. It doesn't have to feel like you're you've got your client on the operating table and on the other side is the correctional officer stabbing him or something. It doesn't have to feel that way. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes people, maybe you know, clinicians early on in this field that uh, can uh, maybe adopt that mentality. So it, it <clears throat> kind of feels somewhat baked into the cake isn't it i mean like they you go into that and and um i mean that that's i don't know if those are stereotypes or just kind of how things have have come to be in in terms of expectations but it almost feels like those things just going into that that you you almost would be primed to expect that whether it's be being an officer or whether it's being you know a clinician who's working with officers for that is like these are these are the things that i can expect because it's just i mean i don't know if that's like built into us but that certainly is something that i even before i started working that that i could expect that and i I, maybe that was just word of mouth from other clinicians um and you know what was going to happen when i was working with officers like the stereotypes of like cops or how officers are yeah yeah what it's like in jail yeah and um and i you know i think especially based on like our experience recently when we were going through training with the officers at Weber County jail, yeah, just how that, like that obviously is not accurate. And that in some cases, I think ha- them having the, the knowledge base of what we're doing um, is a big piece of that. And notice it, like, so it's not just smoke and mirrors and not everything super private and can't be talked about. Like that was actually one thing that, that um, I, I heard about a previous provider. This was direct feedback from folks in in Wyoming Department of Corrections that we talked about was that uh, the one of the previous providers just would not share anything that was going on with the clients, nothing whatsoever, right? Which to me just didn't make a ton of sense. And so despite the fact that they had asked certain things, and, and don't get me wrong, certain things I think are, are privileged information, you know, clearly. That's just confidentiality. But but other things, not so much. I mean, let's not forget, this is an institution in which they're living, and there's rules that need to be followed. And I, I guess one thing that I really appreciated working with security is just learning how much of an idiot I am when it comes to security. Oh, I, have, yeah. I have no clue 
what the hell is going on. And, and I learn way more from officers than, no, than I would normally. Like an example of this a couple times, and I've had to catch myself on this, was like, you know, I'll be drinking like a, an energy drink, right? I'll, I'll drink it in the um, when I'm in there, and then I finish it, and I just throw it in the trash, right? Nope. Right. <laughs> but this is a yeah. trash that they have access to. And I'm like, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that aluminum can can be turned into a weapon, bomb. right? Yeah, or a bomb. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Or, or yeah, or, or some other type of object that yeah. God knows what they'll do with, right? Um, but, but like, like a, a a Doritos bag. Oh yeah, that you one. Know? Yeah, like I was. What, asking, what do they do with that? So there was, um, it was actually not mine, but it was a, it was a like a some sort of yeah bag like that, like a Fritos bag or something like that. And they just asked, hey can you not leave this in here? I'm like, what a Dorit? What are they going to do with that? Like, right. you know, and he, and basically he turned it inside out and showed that the inside was silver and said that, well, what happens is, is they take the razors that are in their razors, you know, their actual razors, yeah, you know, the disposable ones yeah. and then put these in there. So now they have a razor. And then when we inspect it, it looks as if there's a piece of metal in there when really it's it's the silver piece of the chip yeah bag. <laughs> a piece of the chip bag that's in there and so i was like well, dude i would have never even thought about that uh, ever in same. a million years had you not brought that to my attention and so th- those are what what those lessons have taught me is just i'm an idiot when it comes to security and that for my safety and the safety of clients and certainly the safety of the officers like security is king i have to you know there's I have to operate first when I'm coming in there to their house and, and following their rules that security is, is utmost important because if that's not there, like none of what I have to do makes any, makes any difference anyway. Like we can't even make any progress thereafter. And potentially you yourself or your, your own personal security is jeopardized, you know? Right. Like kind of a common thing that if you work in an institution in you're going to know that in the middle of one of your groups or in the middle of one of your, you know, individual therapy sessions that there, there's going to be some type of emergency that's going to go on shutdown and your plans for that day for running the group are dashed and you just have to be okay with it. Right. And I think people maybe, well, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe people don't get too upset about it, but I, I, I think that realizing that, okay, yeah, the work we do is important. The stuff that we've, you know, all, all the, you know, the, the, the whole basis of this podcast is exploring the clinical side to things. You know, of course, it's important, but, you know, uh, security on a fundamental level uh, does take precedence. And ultimately, the techniques and strategies that we're teaching our clients are uh, not nearly as effective if um, a, a shank gets into the prison right. or something. Right. Well, personal, I mean, just think of just the premise of, of therapy groups in general. I mean, like, I, I think as you're getting into just like an outpatient therapy group that if you were holding it, like safety is the number one thing, right? Most of the time they're talking about safety in terms of like, you know, not, not calling each other out or breaking confidentiality or, or, or mm. that we're not going to attack each other within this group in terms like verbally attack one another. But in corrections, I mean, you know, it, it, it's just the nature of the beast that, that there, there's a, 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 a potential threat of of violence not i mean and that's the thing, i don't want to scare people like i don't ever go to work scared no i mean that's not ever how i feel but a reason why that why i feel that way is because i do follow security protocols and i do i i follow the lead of officers who are telling me about security rather than me trying to make up my mind about this because i just don't i've had inadequate training like i know we're going through the academy but I mean that 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 training that I uh, uh, you know was able to accomplish with the academy that, that pales in comparison to direct experience that they have day in and day out and and uh, yeah. I mean a lot of times officers don't get enough credit for that work and in terms of the knowledge base that they have because there's I mean I don't know have any of the officers have been telling stories like just cool stories from things uh, that they've yeah had. different war stories or things that go down right yeah right and 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 there's not really a training template for those experiences you can't like put that into a training and it's more i have a basis of knowledge that i at times need to improvise and adjust to on the fly you know well like stories typically the, the general theme of a story is like some crazy shit went down right and yeah like you by definition like if, if, if it's some crazy shit, if it's like some random event, if it's chaos, the type of thing that makes for a good story, 
it's it's probably because it hasn't really been anticipated mm -hmm. and uh th there's not like a oh do step a b c when this happens but but like what what i've liked and I, i'm sure you've seen this that there's like lots of officers they they give us the respect of that we have the clinical peace mm -hmm. and you know in treatment teams or you know in in uh just talking with officers at the jail when it comes to making a decision like you know i'm clearing somebody from suicide watch or whatever it is they're really cool about being deferential in terms of um letting us be the ones to make the clinical decision even though there's quite a few officers that like they're pretty sharp dudes and they like okay so i have the, a formal educational background but these officers know how people operate and a lot of them are like that they have the same rapport building relationship skills that we have and they have a good sense for if somebody's suicidal or not but yet they still you know give us some deference and i i, I think that we owe it to them as well to you know the same way that they say hey you guys are the therapists um we need to kind of have the same respect for yeah you guys are security keeping us safe and that's like you were saying that's how we have the confidence to not be scared coming to work is they know what they're doing mm -hmm. and they, they they know the things about the freaking doritos bag and the um wh whatever any million other examples that we could uh lean off of that right right well what do you think it is what do you think it is that i guess uh, some common mistakes that clinicians make when when they are interacting with officers that, that tend to i don't know you know spoil the relationship before it ever, you know, gets off the ground that, that, that I, I act in a certain way that makes it, you know, that officers maybe even consider me not to be too security savvy and, and, and then you'd be paid attention to, or, or what is it maybe that clinicians have in mind that you feel like, um, paints the, the, like an us versus them type, type situation. I'm going to pull a Joe Rogan here. i got to look at your mic here real quick. Yeah. Go ahead and talk. You're good. Okay. It's all right. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yes, it is all right. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. Um, I, I think it's operating under the assumption that the correctional officer is against your client. And, you know, because... Again, we're, we're trying to open up uh, avenues. We're trying to help them explore things, uh, you know, be able to understand their emotions better, understand their thought process better. And and sometimes when, you know, correctional officers have to regulate and, you know, enforce a rule, I, I think therapists sometimes can view the enforcement of that rule if it, you know, if it wasn't exactly done with kid gloves. And I'm not talking abuse, but just, you know, the the maybe – a bit gruff enforcement of mm -hmm. a rule, I think, gets interpreted as this this uh, officer is uh, pushing back against what I'm trying to do as a therapist. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen. Like there's, you know, there there's times where you know correctional officers will do something that's definitely contraindicated. And um, <clears throat> but but again, like developing a relationship with the with the CEO is way better than coming at it from an us versus them when. Like, like, for example, and I know I'll circle back around to your original question. Um, yeah, don't dodge it, dude. Yeah, we one of the one of the halfway houses were in Zanuck, mm -hmm. and you know I've I've been working there uh, since I was an intern, so better part of sixteen years, been at Nuke, and you know those uh, the shift leaders there and the correctional officers there. I have a really good working relationship with them. And that's, you know, I give them respect. They give me respect. And we don't always see eye to eye. And and sometimes they'll make a call that I think is punitive or maybe doesn't make sense for the, whatever the infraction is. But I've nurtured the relationship enough that I can just have a conversation with the CO. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe sometimes they'll come around and, uh, see things my way. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes it doesn't matter what I say. They can even agree with what I say, but it's a security concern. So it doesn't matter if they agree with it. It's that they have to enforce it. Mm -hmm. And so I like, I, I guess I would just say to answer your question, to tr treat the, 
treat the relationship with the CEO as uh, being maybe not every bit as important as your client, but but still pretty damn important. You, you, you nurture that relationship and just, you know, get to know the security staff a bit. And a lot of those, I don't know, those, those hurdles will uh, be more manageable. I, I think that's, that's good advice. And I mean, for a variety of reasons. And, and one thing I want to clarify, when you said nuke, it, that's the Northern Utah community correction center that, so it's a halfway house essentially. Um, and I, I guess the point behind that is, you know, if, if I want to be effective within this, like within the work that I'm doing, literally I have to, I mean, part of what I'm doing, I have to have their permission to do the work that I'm doing, right? But then also, I think helping my client, I need to understand the officers as well and how they work security because a lot of times managing risk within a certain set of parameters and rules I need to know those rules and I need to know those, those standards, right? I can't just, I can't, I think a, a common mistake is I'm going to apply like normalcy, whatever the hell that means to a correctional setting. There's nothing normal about it. Like I always tell clients, this is la la land. Like the rules it's that are so strange, right? It, 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 how you operate, like, so this is something I hear from clinicians often and they, and they'll just say, you know, well, that's not normal. That's not, that's not how we normally. Well, yeah, of course it's not because you're in. I mean, it's not normal setting that you're in. It's like, a different world, right? Of course it's not going to add up. It it and you know it's like well we're dehumanizing them. No, that's not it. That's not it whatsoever. We're not trying to dehumanize anybody. What we're saying is that, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, these folks have demonstrated a behavior that's not consistent with, you know, polite society, if you want to call it that. And the great social contract. Sure. Yeah. And and as a result of that, you know, it needs some rehabilitation. So, I mean, uh, I, I can't remember uh, which, man, it was a book that was really pretty sophisticated. It was hard for me to listen to forever, but it was, uh, it was called Behave was the name of the book, and it's by a really smart dude. Yeah, I don't know if you know which one I'm talking about. I know about. the book. I haven't read it. You, you, you've been talking about that book for years. And one of the things, I, I like the analogy that was used in there. It's like if I have a car that does has unsafe brakes that are is on the, that, that's a hazard to be on the road. Right. And if temporarily that car needs to go into the shop and get repaired, okay. Hmm. you know. And, and that's kind of the same thing is, is that certain behaviors, certain ways of thinking, and 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 acting and and maybe you know whatever is going on is just not consistent with other people's you know rights to just be being in the community, and as a result, they need some time away from that. Okay, and then let's rehabilitate them. Okay, so not warehouse, not do any of that stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence to show that the deterrence theory is not a huge factor in this. So, and that's where we come in. But th- just simply saying that you know, well, this isn't normal, and that's not normally how people would resolve these things. Like like an example is um, a, a, an institution in which we work, there's a system called a pull-up system, right? And the pull-up system, <clears throat> make sure I'm describing this correctly, is goes like, okay, if I, if, I, if I see you doing something that is against... As an inmate. As an inmate, yeah. from one inmate to another yeah. inmate. I'm seeing you, observing you engage in a behavior that's against the rules, then my obligation to you is that I give you a pull-up. And essentially, it's it's just a piece of paper um, that says what I observed and what I would want to see different, right? And, um, and I mean, what are the consequences for that? Uh, I did. Do some cleaning sometimes. Yeah, or nothing. Or, 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 or yeah, yeah. Well, or we have them do in our in our work. We have them do a behavior, a behavior chain, chain, right? Yeah. To then be reviewed with their therapist. So really minimal. But like they flip out. They flip. Right. They, their reaction is out of proportion with the punishment. Right. Yeah. Right. And and look, I understand that that some of the things you could categorize. And I, and I think the clients would acknowledge this too. Is some of the things that they're identifying are petty, you know. Oh, it is. Um, Sometimes they, they are. <laughs> but, so, like one of the examples that I thought was like when yeah. somebody didn't clean out the microwave correctly, right? Yeah. Okay, but but I thought about this though. Okay, and um, I thought about cleaning, 
and when we lived in like bachelor pads oh, hell. And, <laughs> and, you, and you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Like you probably see where this is going. I, I remember living with the most filthy creatures on planet earth mm -hmm. as roommates. And, um, despite my best efforts, they just would not clean up after themselves. And I remember one time, one of our good friends, Alan, shout out to Alan falls. Um, he, he lived with a roommate that never did his dishes ever. Right. And um, Alan took all these dishes, dirty as hell, mold grown on them probably, and put them in this guy's bed. I like, did that in, move once to a roommate. Right. Okay. And and what I'm saying is sometimes that can get volatile. Like people come home and they get, I mean, fortunately for Alan, I think, I don't know, maybe this guy was afraid of him or whatever. He just got kind of mad. But what if that turned into a fight, right? And obviously this I is a, what you're saying. So this is a matter of Alan getting so frustrated with this guy because he never cleans up after himself. And maybe, you know, Alan trying to bring a date over or something like that. And there's smelly ass dishes in the sink and he's not cleaning up after himself. Right. And so one thing kind of builds onto another. Right. And, and now this is the only thing he could do. He said, Hey, clean up after yourself, clean up after yourself. Okay. I'm going to take this and put this in your room on your bed. And then maybe this guy brings his girlfriend home and, you know, wants to go to bed. And then now we're into a, a physical confrontation with one another. Right. So some of those things, I think, you know, even though they're tiny, petty, little, little infractions, man, if that's the worst thing that, that's happening right now, and that's the behavior that you need to change that's in, that's impacting another person. Well, I don't know how, I don't know if I really care too much about that. I think that that's a, a pretty good way of addressing that behavior before, before it turns into a big deal. And if it says, Hey, this bothers me. Well, guess what? I can change my behavior and not bother you anymore. And then you're not going to be able, then you're not going to be able to come that direction. If that's, you know, and I can consider it petty. I got to have an opinion and then I, that's it. I just change my behavior and clean up after the, clean up the microwave after there. So you're, so like if we were to like have a continuum on one end, there's chaos and on the other, there's order. And at any given moment, you're, you know, traveling between these two extremes of order and chaos like little things like a dirty microwave is just an incremental step closer to chaos. It's, it's, uh, uh -huh. it's out of the norm. It's it. Some people might look at it as a respect issue is <clears throat> it's something that could potentially along with another, you know, cascading series of events, push things towards chaos, which in a secure setting uh, is quite a problem. Well, yeah. And, and um, well, so I gave you a real world example of two, you know, dudes in college that, that almost went to blows over some dirty dishes. Right. And so, yes, that's what I'm saying is that that wasn't, it wasn't one dirty dish. A dirty dish is meaningless. It was it's months trivial. Of dishes. Right. Yeah. It's, it's the, <laughs> it's the compounded effect of this over time. Maybe not months. And then the interpretation that this is dis disrespectful and then, they, and then maybe a further interpretation that this is deliberately disrespectful. And that point, it's no longer about the dishes. At that point, it's a, you know, screw you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you know that this is unacceptable. And it goes in that direction. The thing that we often people don't factor in is, like, when you're in an institution, things, if you're in prison, things, things that normally don't mean anything mean a lot in there, yeah. okay? So perceived slights are huge. Right. Certain things that you either say and or do, I mean, I, I don't want to say inmates are like, you know, mandated to become physically confrontational over this. But in a lot of cases, that's what they think. They think if you do this, then my next move is this. Because if I don't do this, then there's other people who are watching this and they're going to take advantage of me, you know, on some of those things. It's a very real kind of unspoken rule that has pervaded every institution I've worked at. Right. And so this, this pull up rule, although what I would say is the reason I bring this up is because how many therapists have we worked with that just want to overhaul it completely all the time and get rid of it. I need to talk to such and such, you know, right. the, the high ups and we need to come up with a new behavior management policy. And yeah. that, and that is something that you do not do as a clinician, you, you find out what the system is and then you help your client problem solve right. and you help them find ways to navigate that system appropriately. Exactly. That's what you do because you, you, your job is not to overhaul an entire system that, that for whatever reason was put into place. And, you know, sometimes it's a courtesy that I understand why that system exists. 
And other times, I don't get to know why that system exists. I don't get to know why certain things happen. I just have to know that it exists. And I say, okay, cool. If it's predictable, that's great. Because if I can predict it, then it has an element of control. Because I can modify my behavior around that prediction. And then we can go from there. But clinicians just tend to fight that. They think this is an injustice. And my, my, you know, my client is being abused. And I'm like, well, hold on. Like, he was given a piece of paper by another client. And he had to write on another piece of paper. I'm not sure if that falls into the area of abuse. I, I do want to make sure that the, all the stuff that we're talking about, like there, there is definitely such a thing as abuse of authority. And, and that's not what we're referring to. You know, the, like what, what you're talking about is an opportunity. So rather than <clears throat> focusing on changing the external world, this is an opportunity for your client to learn some frustration tolerance techniques to, you know, all the CBISO stuff we talk about, the emotional regulation, the social skills, understanding the perspective of others, uh, you know, the different, like, you know, thought stopping, all these different skills that we teach, that's the time to apply it, right? You know, and there, look, there are rules that I personally, like, think, oh, that's kind of bullshit, but so what, you know, like, right. that's like that, I mean, I, it's like, I know it's cliche to say, like, that's life, but it kind of is, you know, and there's, there's, there's a, rules that I have to live by laws that I actively don't agree with, but I don't have the power to change those laws. So I have to find a way to operate within those, within those laws and deal with that frustration accordingly. And so I'm not doing my client any favors if I, you know, put on my cape and, you know, swoop in and rescue them by overhauling a system that's, that precedes us and will be there after us. Right. And, and I, and I don't think, like you're not doing the oh, so so did the clients deserve to be validated? Well, a hundred percent, yeah. Like yes. some things are are, are <clears> frustrating. <throat> I get that. I mean, I'm frustrated too sometimes. But but what I don't do is like oh well I'm gonna fix this. No, you're not. You're not gonna fix that. And and what happens is now I make this promise and then and then I categorize it to the client as this is you know abusive or whatever. Yeah. And then now I've aligned myself with them. Great. But, but this is now kind of almost a false alliance because it's beyond the scope of what I'm capable of doing. When, when in reality, it's a real simple shift. Like I, I validate the fact that this is frustrating or it makes them angry and, you know, they have a low tolerance for this, for this at, at this moment. And then I shift gears immediately into, okay, well, how can we, what, what can we do to resolve this? Because there are options there, you know, and, and the best proof I ever have is how many other clients are pulling it off? You know, how many other people are able to pull this off? Right. But you have a problem with this. Well, okay. That, that we could, it's easy to narrow down. There can only be a number of things that, that are really coming up that you have a problem with this. And that the focus should be on the things that the client can control, which <clears throat> is the way they're thinking about it. And, right. Yeah. And their, right. their actions. Well, that's and, our job. Yeah. And of course, like one thing I wanted to do on this was was I didn't want to like just leave us hanging dry. This was something that I wanted to bring up here. Um, when it comes to this was a an article that I pulled up. This is a uh, from Psych Psychiatric Services, the October uh, two thousand one. So semi old, but this talks about the role of correctional officers in multidisciplinary mental health care uh, in prisons, which is a lot of what we're doing. And this one right here kind of this paragraph that's down here, I thought this was of particular importance. It said here, um, the role, of, so it says, clinicians have only brief contact with inmates compared with the daily contact experienced by correctional officers who essentially live with inmates 40 hours a week on the housing units. Officers are typically the first to observe significant changes in an inmate's routine or mental status. In the structured prison environment, bizarre behavior suggestive of mental illness, deterioration in self-care, or an increase in aggressive or irritable behaviors tend to stand out. Mental health staff depend on correctional officers for this information because patients can often look good in a clinician's office once a week, even though their overall function is in fact becoming impaired. Dude, and, that, and I thought that was that was just so well on. said. In terms of like the value of of an officer is is encapsulated so well there. Like I, I I as a clinician, when I'm working with my client, I recognize that it's not hard to pull the wool over my eyes for an hour. Like and in fact, you should be in the camp that like your client is telling you the truth. 
right? I mean, I think clinicians incredibly ineffective if, if you, you know, you all like, you know how an inmate's lying, his lips are moving, you know, whatever the hell they say. Like, yeah. you can't afford to be that way when you're a clinician. You, you have should, a real limited amount of time to interact with the client. We right. can't be playing lie detector. You're right. You're, I mean, you should be more leaning towards, I think this guy's telling me the truth. And that's why it's easy to be duped as a clinician. Yeah. Because, again, you can't be effective if you think they're being dishonest about everything that they're telling you, right? I mean, similarly, like if you went into a doctor and you talk about symptoms, like, yeah, they're lying. Like, no, you got to, yeah. yeah. if I want to help with this, I got to kind of know what's going on. The, the problem is that is that's one measure. That's one measure. That's, that's a client self-report to me and my observations of him or her within that context. But, I mean... When we have behavioral measures of these of officers, you know, observing them for hours on end, like that is that is information that is so un, underutilized that could could make or break, you know, a client's progress and, and would really help you intervene better as a clinician if you were able to get there. You know, that that's why it's I think it's really cool when officers will so that they, they know these dudes and ladies oftentimes better than we do. And they know what they're really like. And yet, a lot of times, they'll still defer to us when it comes to making a decision in their treatment and, you know, saying, well, you're mm -hmm. the therapist. And <clears throat> we, we again, we need to provide them the same respect in that they have a better insight into what's actually going on with the client. This this reminds me of the trainings that you and I used to do at the group home. And we would, we would say to the therapist, your line staff are your biggest asset. They're your biggest tool. They know mm -hmm. the, they know these teenage boys better than anybody. They're the ones that they, they live with them in 40 hours a week. They're the ones that take them on store runs. They're the ones that are getting them ready for, for bed at night and getting them off to, you know, to the, well, the in-house school the next day. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, they, they see how the clients function on a day-to-day -day basis. And so they're, their assessment of what a client is really like as far as like behaviorally is going to be way more accurate. We should be using them as, as an, as like a, as an collateral data source to better understand our clients. Well, and where else do you get that? I mean, where, so if you're in an outpatient clinic working with clients not gonna get it. and, and you have a set one source of information, one, and, and there's no, I mean, it, it isn't like the Truman Show where you have cameras on somebody all day and night. You have one source of information. And I mean, I, it's not like the officers like watching their every move. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they're, <clears throat> for a variety of reasons, they're attuned to minor changes in behavior and demeanor because they're focused so much on safety, right, and, and, and security. But also, you know, I think best day for an officer is kind of a boring day. They go in and yeah. inmates are just kind of doing their thing, minding their own business, and they go and nothing happens, and they dip. You know, that's probably their best day. Right. And so, if anything's out of the ordinary in that regard, they're going to notice. They're going to be the first to notice because it's it's a disruption in the routine. And that's that's one thing again from that study that was kind of pointing out there. We don't. I don't need to pull that up again. This is although correctional officers are not therapists, the most therapeutic intervention that officers provide for inmates is often in the form of clear boundaries and consequences. And so once again, that, that, that is clear boundaries and consequences. What I would say is I think in some, in some ways that's almost superior to the real world, like outside of the prison, because clear boundaries and consequences, like think of, think of a relationship with like, you know, a, a new romantic relationship, clear boundaries and consequences that I don't, it, it's not like I, I, I give you an instruction manual, uh, uh, Here's your uh, here's your boyfriend um, code of conduct, right. and you do these are the viol like that. That's not how relationships work. I have to like cross a boundary to then be corrected, and then you put me back in line. And then sometimes I don't even know that I've done this. And then those boundaries shift over time, and and it, it's so complicated. It's so hard to adapt to. Where a relationship with an officer who is fair, firm, and consistent is is easy to adapt to, and and it should be that way you know, for clients to get there, which is awesome skills for transitioning back to the community, which is a big reason why they were there. It was unadaptability to just rules and regulations that govern our, our daily lives. You know, they're exactly everything you just said that they're talking about that quite a bit in the Wyoming mm -hmm. training mm -hmm. that we're going through. 
upholding those uh, clear boundaries. You know, uh, any consequences need to be levied consistently and instantly. And uh, I mean, we just spent an entire day on manipulation mm -hmm. and kind of the dual relationships and some of the some of the ways that inmates can um, either intentionally or unintentionally just, you know, humans interacting uh, shift those boundaries over time. And so it, like there's a lot of a lot of training for these new COs on how to identify that and how to um, uphold boundaries themselves. And again, like a well, a well-trained staff at, at a correctional facility can be our, our biggest asset. And yeah, just like, I mean, Adam and I had to do a role play today in front of everybody uh, to, to mimic me, the correctional officer holding a, a strong boundary with Adam when he found out that I didn't know what to get my girlfriend for Valentine's <laughs> and he offered to draw me a picture. Yeah. Yeah. And like those, those things, it's like, yeah, an inmate could be volunteering to draw a picture or, you know, these, some of these dudes are amazing artists um, because, you know, they're trying to manipulate you and oh, okay, I got, I got this, uh, this CEO or this, you know, this uh, therapist to, the, to let me draw him a picture. I know he's not supposed to let me do that. Now I got one over on him. They could be doing that. They they also could just be a cool dude that mm -hmm. likes you, the correctional officer, and the inmate wants to do something nice and drawing a picture for you uh, to give to your wife or whatever is uh, is their way of manifesting that. And but it, but it's a it's a facility rule. You can't do it. Right. And yes, COs need to learn the why. Even if it does, and, and and a therapist needed to learn that as well, right? Like, it's good for us to know the why, even if we don't always see eye to eye with the rule and mm -hmm. uphold the rule for the integrity of the facility. And uh, if it's a problem for your client, as if you're the therapist, if it's the problem for your client, work with them on the skills to freaking deal with it. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah, it's well, that. yeah, and the uh, and it's the. It, it, the funny thing is, it, it you know, is it just too, all too often when it comes to, like, inmates, it's like, well, that that's not what old George is doing. He's not doing that. You know, maybe not. Like you said, he might just be a nice guy. But what about all the other inmates who see that? Yep. So now they say, oh, well, it's open season for, you know, therapist Jeff to be able to, you know, help him with his, his girlfriend. So then what happens when, you know, it's not George and it's Cedric or, <laughs> or something and, and you know, he's like, yeah, give this, give this picture to the, to your girlfriend. You know, I mean, he's excellent at drawing penises, you know, so he gives you, he's like, Jeez. you're like, Cedric, I can't accept that. Yeah. Well, oh, hold on, hold on, uh, Jeff, because you let George draw you a picture and what you got to think against penises or, you know what I mean? Like it, it turns into, it's not no longer, right. So now I'm keeping secrets. Um, now I'm justifying my own behavior. Now I'm like, now, and, and I'm, I'm treating them inconsistently and it causes a lot of problems. So again, these are, yes. Is that normal? Of course not. Like I get a, I get to pick who my friends are and who I will associate with outside of this. That, yeah. Of course, that's not normal. Accept that. It's not normal. That's not how, that's not how the real world works. But having that professional boundary helps helps the clients adapt to that better if, if if everything if the goalposts keep shifting from moment to moment it's going to be hard for them to adapt right yeah. so like a, i mean i don't know you know how much more we want to get into this but I, I i just think some core values to kind of go through with that a couple of things i was thinking was have patience like have patience with the officers because they're learning as well and and also you know they may be viewing you through a stereotypical lens of like a hug a thug yeah. or whatever <laughs> that yeah. has been bestowed onto them from other officers that may not know much about you, right? <clears throat> okay. That's awesome because like I have a whole lot of room for improvement, right? It's the same thing I, I apply to like why we work with high risk clients. They have much more room for improvement. So if you think I'm a total douche walking into a well, you'd be right. But mm -hmm. I mean if, if I was if you thought I was a hug a thug and that I and that I didn't care about correctional values and all the rest of it. Awesome. Because I'm going to be able to show you that that's just not true. And then it's almost surprising. It's like refreshing for them when they're able to see that. So be patient and, and also be 
be be patient with the idea that you just don't know what's going on, which kind of brings like you, you need to exercise humility, right? Like correctional humility. When I go in there that I don't know why this rule exists at times and it's okay that I disagree with this rule. Um, but I'm still going to, I'm still going to be following this because at the end of the day, I think it's, 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 it's about my safety. As long as I remind myself that it's about my safety, I I don't really care if I don't understand it. Like it's not, who cares? It's not really up to me. I mean, officers aren't telling me how to write my treatment plans. You know, they're not, they're not getting evasive like that. I would never try to tell them, Hey, this is how you need to do your safety stuff. I just listen to them and and do what's all in. So patience, humility. I mean, what else? I mean, what else? What are we missing there? I think humility <clears throat> is like a cornerstone for it, honestly. Like, right. I mean, we could come up with other virtues if we want to keep going down a list, but I, I think uh, humility is a good, good practice as a <clears throat> clinician in general, not just in corrections. I just in the so uh, Mason, I just did a training for our for our staff, and we, you know, talked about. Well, like p- part of it was once you're fully licensed, you like you're not done learning, you know. And like a lot of therapists will do that; they'll they get their license, their their L, and you know, aside from just taking care of their mandatory CEUs, they seem to like shift the idea that they still have stuff to learn. Mm-hmm. They've got too much hubris, you know. And uh, being able to say, "All right, I don't know it all," there's you know. I can learn something from my clients. I can learn something from my colleagues. If I'm a clinical supervisor, I can learn something from the new intern. Like ha- having the willingness to be open and then packaging that up and taking it into the facility that you work. And, um, you know, if there's a rule that seems to rub you the wrong way or you don't understand it, like the pull-up system at the prison, like, like take a step back, you know, shut your mouth, observe, watch, mm-hmm. see why the rule exists. And, uh, have the again have the humility to accept that okay maybe this is the best way uh for this rule to be in place and then okay how can i help my client navigate this so that he doesn't get in trouble and manages the way he feels about it a little bit better and then, right. then you're doing a good job right operate within the system rather than trying to change the system and i guess one one other thing as i was thinking as we were talking is um you know because you're going to be working with these folks and because essentially they're giving you permission to do the work that, that we, you know, need to do. Um, I think it's, you know, um, we've had clinicians in the past where they're like, I won't, I won't even talk to officers, but you know, like, come on, like how effective is that going to be? Right. You, you should have a civil, if not friendly relationship with these folks. Absolutely. Um, I mean, remember this is essentially like they're living with inmates 40 hours a week and we're, we're on a field trip there. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, to somehow suggest that we're above talking to them. Um, and one of our, our therapists, shout out to Nina Baki. She like is an expert at this, you know, of just being personable and getting to know people and spending, you know, three, five minutes at a time talking to somebody. And the, the how I've seen her ability to navigate, an institution off of those small relations, which I mean, and it's not, it's not like superficial. It's not just done for the sake of doing it. It's done because you genuinely are, she's genuinely trying to learn more about this person um, and and be able to be personable with them. She, she cares about those relationships. And as a result of that, like a lot of what she tries to do is super easy for her to get around an institution that is incredibly secure. Right. Don't do that. If you don't do that, Good luck. You're going to have a lot of walls. Yeah, good luck. I mean, literal walls. Yeah. You know, like, uh, hey, can I get this door open? You know, because <laughs> only the officers have keys. And it's like, oh, where, where's that dude again? You know? Yeah. And, and well, we'll get that jump with the chance yeah. to help Nita. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get back to it after the end of this quarter. Like, that. that's, you know, yeah. and I can't blame them if all we are are jerks to them and don't take time to get to know them. So I think they deserve that. And, and I mean just for the sake they're keeping us safe. Like, come on, man. Right. Like you owe it to them at that point. Like these people are legit. So keeping you, keeping you safe as a matter of, I mean, if all, 
I don't know. I fancy myself able to defend myself, but if all the inmates wanted to attack me, I'd be like, oh, okay. That might be a problem. I, yeah. <laughs> I hope officers are around to take care of this. Yeah. I mean, I've never been in a situation, like I said, where I felt intimidated or scared. That's not it. I, I'm, I'm saying that officers' presence there is is security in and of itself, and we owe them the respect. So, right. so yeah, patience, humility, respect. I think those are three virtues that clinicians entering this field can exercise and and I think just be more effective as clinicians if they're able to pull that off. So patience, humility, and respect. Yeah. Yeah. Love so it. cool. Yep. Uh, anything else we need to add to this? I think we can close there. Cool. Cool. So I think, uh, next episode, hopefully we get Mark in here and we'll talk, uh, talk about uh mouse for hope. And then, um, yeah, we have some other folks on the horizon, but yeah. So until next time, hopefully you guys like our ugly faces. So get used to it. Cause it's not going anywhere. <laughs> so thanks guys. 50 minutes.